Good evening. My name is Madison Mangles, and I am a Kevin B. Harrington Student Ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this evening's event. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin this evening's program, I would just like to remind you to turn off any cell phones or other devices that may make noise. Tonight's speaker, Danielle Thompson, is an assistant professor at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. She received her PhD from Cornell University in 2014. Prior to her position at Syracuse University, Ms. Thompson was a postdoctoral fellow in the Political Institutions and Public Choice Program at Duke University. She has been the recipient of over 10 fellowships and grants, including the E.E. E. Schott Schneider Award in 2015 for the best dissertation in polit American politics. Tonight, Ms. Thompson will be joining us to discuss her latest book, Opting Out of Congress, Partisan Polarization and the Decline of Moderate Candidates. Her work shows that ideological moderates are less likely to run for and remain in Congress than those at the extremes. According to Ms. Thompson, the future of bipartisanship in Congress will depend on reformers' encouragement of moderate congressional candidates. Following Ms. Thompson's remarks, we will have a brief question and answer period. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Danielle Thompson. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, before I start, I just want to thank uh, Professor Jennifer Lucas for inviting me here. I want to thank St. Anselm College and the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. I want to thank Anne for helping to make all of the arrangements. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to be presenting from my recent book manuscript that came out this year, which was published with Cambridge University Press, called Opting Out of Congress, Partisan Polarization, and the Decline of Moderate Candidates. So just about a decade ago, after the 2006 congressional elections, Time Magazine suggested that the ideological center was, quote, the new place to be. But the numbers tell a different story. Since then, virtually all of the moderates in congressional office have retired. One of the more recent examples is Charlie Dent, co-chair of the Tuesday group of moderate Republicans, who announced his retirement last year, citing the increased polarization and ideological rigidity that leads to dysfunction, disorder, and chaos. Longtime Republican Senator Olympia Snow similarly blamed hyperpartisanship and the my way or the highway ideologies in Congress as the singular reason for her exit from office. As Nolan McCarty, a political scientist at, at Princeton University, recently wrote, what is remarkable about this story is how unremarkable it is. Indeed, these articles have become a staple after every election and notable retirement. What is more, virtually no moderates have entered in their place. There is currently no ideological overlap between the two parties in Congress, and the middle has all but disappeared. This graph shows the sharp decline in ideological moderates since the mid-20th century. Moderates have now vanished from the Republican side, and their numbers have decreased dramatically on the Democratic side as well, though the coalition of Blue Dog Democrats has managed to hang on to a few seats. The absence of moderates from Congress today is particularly striking from an historical perspective. Where just 40 years ago, more than half of members of Congress were at the ideological center. At that time, the most prominent committees were <coughs> shared by moderates, and even into the 1980s and early 1990s, liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats were numerous enough that their votes were needed and they had to pass policies and they had leverage as a result. 
The decline in moderates is an integral part of why the ideological gulf between the Republican and Democratic parties is now at a post-Reconstruction high. Partisan polarization has been one of the most prominent topics of congressional debate for the last decade. The policymaking process is almost completely divided along party lines, and the partisan discord that now pervades Congress fuels government gridlock and impedes legislative productivity. I also want to briefly mention what a growing number of scholars have called asymmetric polarization. And this is the idea that while both parties have moved away from the center, the Republicans have moved farther to the right than the Democrats have left. My primary focus is on the decline in ideological moderates in both parties, but I'm happy to talk more about asymmetric polarization in the Q&A as well. So to better understand the mechanisms that are driving these recent partisan trends, my book examines the types of individuals who run for office or put differently, the choices that voters are given when they go to the polls. My particular concern is why polarization has persisted and continued to increase in recent years. And I suggest that the growing distance between the two parties is due in part to the ideological makeup of the supply of congressional candidates. The main argument is that moderates are less likely to run for and remain in Congress than those at the extremes because the benefits of serving in, con in congressional office are too low for them to do so. This is important because if the only individuals who run for office come from the ideological extremes, it is unlikely that polarization will fade anytime soon. I'm going to talk mostly about my book today, but more broadly I'm interested in who runs for office and how the quality of legislative representation is diminished when only a narrow subset of individuals seeks elected office. The decision to run for Congress and patterns of candidate entry have received little attention from polarization scholars, but the how of polarization, the mechanisms of polarization are crucial for thinking about how to address and counteract these troubling trends in Congress. So I'm going to start today by reviewing what we do and don't know about polarization. Then I'm going to talk about how my book builds on previous research and extends our understanding of partisan polarization. I'm going to introduce a new data set that I use to shed light on these moderates opting out of congressional office, and I'll briefly discuss how this general argument can be applied beyond polarization and to understand questions about women's representation as well. First though, I want to briefly discuss two culprits that are widely perceived to be, but probably are not, driving these recent changes in polarization. The first of these is gerrymandering. The basic logic is that distri districts have become increasingly safe, electoral competition has declined, and only conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats can win in conservative and liberal districts. However, the academic consensus is that gerrymandering matters anywhere from a little bit to not at all. First, there are the obvious counterpoints of the Senate and at-large congressional districts, which have experienced increasing polarization as well, but of course, no redistricting. Moreover, McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal show that polarization is due to the differences in how re Republicans and, de and Democrats represent moderate districts, rather than an increase in the number of extreme partisan districts. The second most commonly cited culprit for polarization points to primary elections. <coughs> the logic is similar. Safe districts suggest that the heart of competition is at the primary stage, and candidates try to maximize their votes from extreme party activists. However, it is again difficult to find empirical support linking party primaries with polarization. There is little evidence that the introduction of primary elections, the level of primary turnout, or the threat of primary competition is associated with partisan polarization in roll call voting. Differences in primary rules also seem to provide few answers. So closed primaries, or those in which only party members can vote, do not produce more extreme candidates than open primaries. 
Similarly, a few recent studies of the top two primary in California, which was widely expected to result in the election of more moderate candidates, has shown that it has yet to produce this int intended effect. So in short, while it is widely assumed that gerrymandering and primary election systems are driving these recent partisan changes in Congress, the evidence to support this claim is lacking. Political scientists have instead focused on two main types of explanations for polarization, mass level explanations and elite level explanations. Mass level explanations take a few forms. We know first that the parties have realigned regionally with the Democrats losing out in the South and the Republicans losing out in the Northeast. Second, we know that voters are better sorted ideologically into their respective parties, with conservatives aligning with the Republicans and liberals aligning with the Democrats. And third, while the question of voter polarization has been heatedly debated among political scientists, most scholars agree that partisan activists are more extreme than they used to be. Elite level explanations instead point to procedural changes that have occurred within Congress. Both parties have become more homogeneous over the past 50 years and members delegate more power to party leaders to pursue an increasingly partisan legislative agenda. Party leaders have assumed greater responsibility in allocating committee assignments, setting the legislative agenda and structuring debate on the floor. Majority party leaders draw extensively on legislative procedure to exert their will, and the divides on procedural issues have further exacerbated the disparity between the parties. My research builds on these explanations, but sheds new light on the puzzle of polarization by instead analyzing the types of candidates who run for congressional office. I suggest that the skewed supply of congressional candidates is an untold part of the polarization story. My book examines two distinct mechanisms that drive these recent partisan trends in Congress. The first is the abstention of moderates from the candidate pool. I focus on state legislators because they've long been understood to be in the pipeline to congressional office. We know that more than half of members of Congress have state legislative background, and this makes <coughs> sense because it's at the state legislative level where members learn how to campaign as well as how to legislate. The second mechanism for why there's been a hollowing out of the political middle examines the types of members who are leaving congressional office. I analyze member retirement patterns, and I find that moderates are less likely to seek re-election than those at the extremes. I also conducted more than 20 interviews with former members of Congress who were ideological moderates to get a better idea of the types of experiences that moderates had in Congress as polarization increased. I will be inserting some of their insights into the talk today, but I can speak more about the interviews in the Q&A as well. I'm going to focus mostly on the abstention of moderates from the candidate pool today for a couple of reasons. For one, the decline of moderates in congressional office has been discussed almost exclusively in terms of member attrition and procedures within Congress. Yet, as Adam Bonica, a political scientist at Stanford, wrote, the more relevant question is why a new generation of moderates never arrived in Congress to replenish their ranks. <laughs> We know that the replacement of candidates is responsible for much of the rise in polarization, but we know little about why these replacements are more extreme than their predecessors. Second, there have been virtually no empirical analyses of why some state legislators run for Congress and others do not, or more generally about how ideology influences the decision to run for office among those in the candidate. So the argument here is not incompatible with either the mass level or the elite level explanations that I just talked about, and in fact, it builds on them. But it does shift the analysis to the candidate level to more fully understand why the parties have continued to move towards the extremes. Again, the how of polarization is especially important as different types of actually, actual policy solutions are being proposed and put in place as a way to minimize polarization. For example, initiatives that seek to hire third parties to redraw congressional districts 
or efforts to change the type of primary system might not be a cure-all or even a partial solution for decreasing partisan polarization in Congress. So my book develops a party fit explanation for why some individuals seek elected office and others do not. The decision to run for office is particularly important in the American context because political candidates have long been understood to be self-starters. They file their own paperwork to become candidates, they raise their own money to fund their campaigns, and they are in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of their campaigns. While party leaders certainly try to encourage and discourage individuals, the decision to seek office is ultimately made by the candidate herself, and it is the candidate who bears responsibility for the outcome. So there's a variety of factors that influence the decision to run for office, such as whether there's an incumbent seeking re-election, the partisan makeup of the district, the individual's ability to fund a campaign, and her previous political experience. I introduced the concept of party fit into studies of candidate emergence, and I suggest that ideology matters for the calculus of candidacy and the decision to seek elective office. Party fit is the ideological congruence between a candidate and the party to which she would belong upon election. The central theoretical argument is that party fit matters for legislators' ability to achieve their policy, party, and personal goals with moderates today much less likely to receive these benefits than those at the extremes. <coughs> In the contemporary political context, it is difficult for moderates to influence the legislative agenda given that the party leadership is primarily in charge of setting the agenda. It is unlikely that moderates can advance within the chamber or obtain a choice committee assignment given that the party leadership has significant control in this area as well. Furthermore, the congressional environment has become particularly hostile and isolating for those in the political middle as there are fewer and fewer members who share their ideological worldview. I depart from the idea of the May David Mayhew's view of legislators as single-minded seekers of re-election and instead focus on the policy, party, and personal benefits of the office itself. The idea that there is more to running for Congress than winning elections the winning elections have recently been emphasized by members of Congress themselves. In Jeff Flake's recent retirement speech, for example, he said, we are not here simply to mark time. Sustained incumbency is certainly not the point of seeking office. Ileana ross Leighton from Florida said in her retirement announcement, it was just a realization that I could keep getting elected, but it's not about getting elected. One of the party recruiters I interviewed said that the ability to get something done is always a question for people that want to serve in public office. One former member noted, those in office want to affect outcomes. They want to be legislators, not orators. In my book, I draw on interviews with more than 20 former member, moderate members of Congress to illustrate how, the con how congressional s service worsened for those in the middle as the parties became more polarized. I'm going to highlight here a few examples of how the policy, party, and personal benefits of serving in Congress diminished for moderates as the parties drifted apart. So with respect to their declining policy impact, one moderate I interviewed said, quote, we would appoint a delegation to, spe to see the speaker, majority leader, or whip and say, I've got 40 votes in my pocket that are no unless you bend the policy. We were a force to be reckoned with. If we didn't go with them, they didn't have a majority. We could influence state policy on a daily basis. This is a guy who served, a member who served in the 1990s, and he was touting the influence that they had at that time. Compared to 10 years after that, another member said, you can't go across the aisle like you used to to get things done. People come here to get things done. They came to help their community get things fixed in their community and create a better quality of life. You can't do that now. It does change the reward for all the sacrifices you make to be there. With respect to their diminishing party rewards over time, one moderate said, who I interviewed, said, if you dare deviate too much from the party line, you pay a penalty. The next time comes around and you want a better committee assignment, you're given little attention. I didn't have a chance of getting ways and means energy and commerce or appropriations because I deviated too much from the party position. <coughs> One member 
who I spoke with said, when we lost the Republican, when we lost the majority in 2006, the ranking member determined that my future wasn't on the railroad subcommittee, it was on the Coast Guard subcommittee, which was not a very good post. It was particularly not a good post for this member because he was from Ohio. I objected and he said, well, it's your labor votes, we can't have you do that. I went to the speaker at that time, John Boehner, who's his friend from Ohio, and he said he'd talk to the ranking member. He did, and it didn't make any difference. The member concluded, they can't kill you, but what they can indicate is, well, you're done. You're not going to be in charge of railroads anymore. Changes in the congressional environment has, itself have received very little <coughs> attention from scholars of polarization. <coughs> But almost all of the moderates that I talked to spoke at length about how congressional service itself worsened as the parties drifted apart. The members said, quote, the job became frustrating, unsatisfying, and increasingly confrontational. Everything was a fight. Another member said, every day going out and being the, going in and being the odd man out is grueling, it's exhausting, it's corrosive. One member said, it's not fun anymore. Your job is not supposed to be fun like going to an amusement park but it should be pleasant. Members are saying it's not pleasant now. Legislators have such intense feelings. You're viewed like a heretic by people who have a different point of view than you. That's not very good, not very healthy for the republic. One of my favorite stories came from um, a moderate member who was talking about going, going up to the House floor to cast a vote, and he found himself, he was a Republican, he found himself in, the ele in an elevator with a more conservative um, Republican colleague. And his colleague turned him and said, say, you're one of those moderate, middle-of-the-road types, right? And he turned to him and said, yes, I identify as a, an ideological moderate. And his colleague said back, there are two things that belong in the middle of the road, yellow lines and dead skunks. The short story is that moderates now face an increasingly hostile congressional environment. This is the far cry from the notion that the most coveted position in Congress is the one held by the median legislator. So the main argument of the book is that ideological moderates, these liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats, are less likely to run for and remain in congressional office than those at the extreme because the benefits of serving in Congress are too low for them to do so. Again, I focus here on moderates due to their importance for the widening of the gulf between the two parties and the rise in polarization, but I'm happy to talk about ideologues too and how the party policy and personal benefits of the office differ from moderates and those at the extremes. So I'm focusing on moderates today. So I draw on a new data set created by Adam Bonica of Stanford University that places a wide range of political actors on a common ideological scale. Bonica uses campaign finance data to create ideological estimates of members of Congress, state legislators, PACs, interest groups, as well as individual donors. Importantly here, this data set includes estimates of state legislators who did and did not run for Congress. So there are several advantages to using these data on top of the fact that state legislators comprise the most likely pool of congressional candidates. First, because ideology is placed on a common scale, we can readily make comparisons across individuals as well as levels of office. Second, due to the size of the data set, there's a lot of variation across a host of key variables that we care about, like seat type and district partisanship. And third, the data are pooled over time and they span multiple election cycles. So I'm interested in the relationship between a state legislator's party fit and her decision to run for Congress. The data set that I'm using includes more than 30,000 state legislators who did and did not run for Congress between 2000 and 2010. The time period of the data allows me to speak primarily to recent changes in polarization, but there's suggestive evidence that patterns of candidate emergence contributed to polarization in previous decades as well. So the, out, the main outcome that I'm interested in is just coded one, it's if, they were, if they ran for Congress, and zero if they ran for the state legislature again. The main independent variable of interest is the state legislator's distance between her and the party leadership in Congress. So we could think about measuring this concept of party fit in a variety of ways, but in light of the non-electoral goals that I talked about, Earlier, it seems most appropriate to measure party, leader, party fit as distance from the party leadership. 
A side note is that another benefit of using these data is that the absolute distance between the state legislator and the party leadership in Congress can be precisely measured since they're all on the same scale. So I also account for a host of variables that are also expected to matter for the decision to run for Congress, including district ideology, whether an incumbent was running in the district, party, the amount of money they raised as state legislators, their experienced state legislators, gender and partisan control of the state legislature. So before getting into the results, I just want to show you the data descriptively. So again, these are state legislators serving from 2000 to 2010. In the next few slides, I'm going to re reference a handful of current and former members of Congress. These include conservatives like John Boehner on the Republican side, who was the leader of the Republican Party during this time period, and liberals like Nancy Pelosi on the Democratic side, who is the current minority leader. I will also refer to former moderate Republicans like veteran Maine Senator Olympia Snow, and moderate Democrats like John Tanner, a longtime representative from Tennessee and a founder of the Blue Dog Coalition of Moderate Democrats. And we can see here that they fall along the ideological spectrum much as we would expect, with Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner towards the um, outer poles of the party, and Olympia Snow and John Tanner closer to the ideological center. Another thing to note from this slide is the purple. Okay, and this is the ideological overlap between state legislators. So it is not the case that there are no moderate state legislators who are available to run for Congress. Nearly 30% of Democratic state legislators are at least as conservative as John Tanner, and nearly 20% of Republican state legislators are at least as liberal as Olympia Snow. So the problem is not one that there are no moderates in state legislative office who are available to run for Congress. Now here is the ideological distribution of the runners, the state legislators who ran for congressional office. We can see first that Boehner and Pelosi are squarely in the center of the distribution of runners. We can also see that there are virtually no runners who resemble John Tanner or Olympia Snow. That overlap, that purple that we saw in the previous slide has all but disappeared when we look at those who actually run for congressional office. Put somewhat differently, here's the proportion of moderates, those who resemble Olympia Snow and John Tanner, and ideologues, those who resemble, at that time, John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi, in state legislative office who ran for Congress. To be sure, hardly anyone runs for office at all, um, but nearly three per, for congressional office. Nearly 3% of state legislators who resemble Pelosi and Boehner ran for Congress, compared to 0.6% of Democratic state legislators who resemble Tanner, and 0.2% of Republicans who resemble Snow. The short story is that moderate state legislators are much less likely to run for Congress than conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats. The differences across these types of state legislators is striking. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you some results for open seats in particular due to the fact that most state legislators wait for an open seat and more incoming members enter through open seats. Patterns of candidate entry in open seats are particularly important for understanding recent changes in polarization. Gaddy and Bullock write, open seats, not the defeat of incumbents, are the portal through which most legislators enter Congress. In fact, over three-fourths of all incoming candidates during this time won in open seats, and those who enter through open seats thus have a greater ability to spur these ideological shifts due to their larger numbers. So this graph shows on the y-axis the predicted probability of running for Congress across a range of state legislators. We can see that the likelihood of running for Congress decreases as state legislators' distance from the party increases. The probability that a conservative Republican state legislator who resembles John Boehner runs in, in an open seat is 9% versus 0.9% for a moderate like Sherry Bowler, who is a moderate New York Republican who is best known for his work on environmental protection. 
Similarly, the probability that a liberal Democrat like Debbie Wasserman Schultz, former chair of the DCCC, runs in an open seat is 2.6% compared to 0.3% for a moderate like Bev Byron, a former Democrat from Maryland who was pro-life and often broke from her party on military and defense issues. So liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans in state legislative office are much more likely to run for congressional office than those in the ideological middle. So the party fit argument that I'm making in this book highlights the importance of the value of the office for the calculus of candidacy. But a lot of research has shown that the electoral considerations, whether or not individuals think they can win, are central to, this, to the decision to run. Thus, although congressional districts have become more homogeneous and voters are better sorted, we might still expect to see variation across districts in the types of candidates who run. So a larger number of moderate Republicans may run in liberal districts, and a larger number of moderate Democrats may run in conservative districts. Or fewer moderates may run in the most conservative districts, and fewer moderate Democrats may run in the most liberal districts. In addition, we might expect to see variation depending on how conservative or liberal party activists are. Lastly, my moderates might be more likely to run in toss-up seats because they expect to attract the most support in the general election. So I examine all of these various electoral logics um, with respect to the candidates who ran for Congress in the 2000 to 2012 cycles. I use different um, I use estimates of congressional district ideology from Chris Tasanovich and Chris Warshaw and the ideology of for the ideology of the district as well as the partisans in each district and Cook Political Report's list of toss-up seats during this period. So the figure shows the number of Republican candidates who ran for Congress between 2000 and 2012 who were at least as moderate as Olympia Snow, the former moderate legislator from Maine. So on the top you can see the number of Olympia Snows who ran in the 25 most conservative districts. Below that, the number of Olympia Snows and other Republicans who ran in the most liberal districts. Below that, we see the 25 districts with the most conservative Republican partisans and districts with the most liberal Republican partisans. Here we have the Cook toss-up piece that I talked about. So to be sure, a larger number of Olympia Snows are running in in liberal districts and in districts with more liberal Republican partisans. And a smaller number ran in conservative districts and in districts with the most conservative Republican partisans. Yet we must also keep in mind that these figures span seven election cycles. The more general pattern is that very few Olympia Snows are running for Congress regardless of the makeup of the district, the makeup of party activists, or the closeness of the race. Of the nearly 4,000 Republican candidates who ran during this time period, only 228, or 6%, were at least as moderate as Olympia Snow. In short, individuals like Snow have opted out of congressional elections, and it matters relatively little whether the district is more or less conservative, whether activists are more or less conservative, or whether the seat is a toss-up. <coughs> When we look at the Democrats, this figure shows the number of Democratic candidates that are at least as moderate as John Tanner across these same different types of districts. The numbers echo those on the Republican side. A larger number of candidates, like John Tanner, ran in conservative districts and in districts with the most conservative Democratic partisans. And a smaller number ran in the most liberal district and in districts with the most liberal Democratic partisans. But again, the general pattern is of individuals like John Tanner simply not running anywhere. Of the 3,600 Democrats who ran for Congress during this time, a mere 170 or 5% were at least as moderate as John Tanner. So it's less clear how well these pure electoral-based logics can explain current patterns of candidate entry. 
At the very least, we would expect to see more variation across different types of congressional districts. So I just want to reiterate here that the previous results highlighted two main sort of patterns. First, ideological moderates, liberal Republicans, and conservative Democrats in the congressional pipeline in state legislative office are less likely to run for Congress. We did not talk about those who retire, but the same patterns are emerging there as well, and I can talk about that in the Q&A um, if you'd like. Their moderates are less likely to run for Congress than those at the extremes. Second, this probability reaches its height among ideologues in open seats, which especially matters for recent changes in polarization. So in the final part of the talk, I want to briefly demonstrate the broader applicability of this general argument that I'm making to questions beyond polarization. I'm going to show you in the next few slides how these same ideological patterns of candidate entry and exit that I talked about have implications for women's representation in Congress as well. Namely, why the, per the percentage or proportion of Democratic women in Congress has increased steadily over the past uh, three decades, while the percentage of Republican women has barely grown during this time. So the number of women in the Democratic Party has grown steadily over the past 30 years. There's now 62 women in the Democratic Caucus, and they comprise nearly a third of the Democratic Party. The representation of women in the Republican Party pales by comparison. Republican women have comprised between 6 and 10 percent of the party since the 1980s. There are now 22 women in the GOP and they make up 9 percent of the party caucus. So most scholars of gender and politics have focused on why women do not run for office, but we know little about why some women run for office and others do not or why these figures vary over time or between the two parties. Studies of partisan polarization have been largely divorced from research on gender and politics, but this is surprising given the growing partisan gap among women in Congress. So my book sheds light on this growing partisan disparity among women in Congress by examining variation across women in the decision to run for and remain in congressional office. So the results that I presented earlier demonstrated that ideologically moderate male and female state legislators are less likely to run for Congress than those at the extremes. By further unpacking women as a category, we can see that some women are just significantly more likely to run for office than others. For example, a conservative Republican state legislator who resembles Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee is significantly more likely to run for Congress than a moderate state legislator who resembles Olympia Snow. I suggest that these same ideological patterns of candidate entry and exit matter most for Republican women. First, there's a dearth of Republican, of conservative women in the congressional pipeline. Second, Republican women in Congress were to the ideological left of their male co-partisans for much of the late 20th century. So the exit of moderate incumbents disproportionately cut the ground out from Republican women in office at that time. I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. So with respect to the makeup of the pipeline, again, these are state <coughs> legislators who are in the traditional pipeline to run for Congress. There are very few ideologically conservative Republican women state legislators. Republican women make only a small appearance, conservative Republican women make only a small appearance in the state legislative pool, and there are more than five times as many men as women in the conservative half of the pool. The rates of running are similar for conservative Republican men and women at 2.4% and 2.1%. But because there are very few conservative Republican women, this translates into a huge gender difference in political candidacies. Of these state legislators, 143 conservative Republican men ran for office compared to 25 conservative Republican women. On the Democratic side, the gender disparity is much smaller in the pool of liberal state legislators, which is comprised of 36% women and 64% men. 
again, virtually the same percentage of liberal Democratic men and women ran for Congress at 1.4% and 1.6%. And this amounted to uh, 44 liberal Democratic women who ran and 74 uh, women and 74 liberal Democratic men who ran. The greater the number of women in the ideologically liberal pool of Democrats also means that there are more who have a chance to run in an open seat. Second, Republican women were on average to the left of their male counterparts throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Here. Members like Olympia Snow, Connie Morella, Sue Kelly, Lynn Martin, and Nancy Johnson came from the moderate wing of the party and Republican women were disproportionately affected by the rise in polarization. There has been a near complete makeover of Republican women in Congress over the past 20 years. The moderates of yesterday have been replaced by the Martha Robies and Marsha Blackburns of today. GOP women are very ideologically conservative and they are mirror images of the Paul Ryans and Kevin McCarthy's that are now um, the majority of the party caucus. In fact, of the 22 Republican women serving in Congress right now, only two of them have been in office since before 2000. And one of them, Ileana Roth Leighton, is set to retire this year. Their average election year was 2006. You can see here that throughout the 1980s as well as the 1990s, the, the number of Republican and Democratic women with at least eight years of experience in Congress was virtually the same. These trends have diverged sharply over the past decade and the retention rates of Republican women differ dramatically from those on the Democratic side. There are now 62 Democratic women in the House of Representatives and 21 of them have served in office since before 2000. This comparative longevity in congressional <laughs> service has allowed Democratic women to rise to increasingly powerful positions in the chamber as well. These ideological patterns of candidate entry and exit that I talked about matter for the partisan disparity among women in office. So this general argument that I'm making in the book helps us to understand changes in the types of women who are elected to office and the policies they promote. In the 1980s and 1990s, Republican women were a moderate faction in their party, and many of them were prominent leaders on a variety of poly policy issues, including but not limited to women's issues. Moderate Republican women mattered for not only for levels of women's representation, but also for the day-to-day -day operations of Congress and the nature of policy outcomes. This large turnover of Republican women over the past two decades has implications for recent changes in the ideological profile of GOP women, as well as their ability to advance to influential positions in the legislature. So I want to again summarize the main takeaways from my research. So my book introduces the concept of party fit into, into studies of candidate emergence and explains why some individuals run for office and others do not. In doing so, I provide a candidate entry explanation for recent partisan trends in Congress. And I highlight the candidate level mechanisms that continue to drive partisan polarization. Lastly, I briefly showed how the framework can shed light on contemporary patterns of women's representation as well. So to conclude, the common thread across my research is to better understand the decision to run for office and examine how that matters for broad questions that political scientists and the American public care about. The dramatic rise in polarization and the quality of political competition in elections. These questions are also of concern to political reformers as different types of actual policy solutions are being proposed and enacted in an attempt to both minimize political polarization and promote electoral competition. From a normative perspective, the quality of political representation is compromised when only a narrow subset of individuals runs for office or when electoral competition is not as healthy as we would like it to be. The democratic ideal deeply depends on and indeed takes for granted the existence of a vibrant and diverse pool of candidates from which voters can choose. 
the composition of this pool of congressional candidates thus has serious consequences for the makeup of Congress and the nature of legislative representation. Thank you for your time.